You know what? Last night was special. Last night I was in the zone. I was playing vinyl. The music spoke to me deeply. <laughs> it was really incredible. Now, I, I love vinyl. I always have. But listen, I'm not suggesting that all audiophiles should be into it. No, not really. Some people have already been there, done that. They don't want to go back to vinyl ever. Some people never had it, don't know what they're missing. That's okay too. Now, if you're drawn to it in any way, if you're vinyl curious, I highly recommend taking some steps. Absolutely. But anyway, I'm going to tell you a couple of uh, little stories along the way. Oh, and there will be, absolutely, there will be an audiophiliac viewer system of the day at the conclusion of the episode. And please, by the way, if you have not yet subscribed, <laughs> this would be a perfect time to do it. Hit that button right down there. Super easy. Hit the bell and you will be notified every time there's an incredible new episode. But anyway, I want to tell you about a conversion, so to speak, an audiophile conversion. So there was this guy who worked at CNET. We were friends. We talked about music all the time, but he was in no way, shape, an audiophile. But he was, he was not an audiophile. He could care less. He liked music. That was it. He had cheap earbuds. He plugged them into his phone. Phones still had jacks on them. He was good to go. He didn't need anything else. And then, and then it happened. I think he had an uncle. And he gave him, the uncle gave him a turntable, a stereo receiver, and a decent set of speakers, and a bunch of records, like a hundred albums. And this guy, just head over heels in love playing records. Every time I saw him, before we always talked about music, but never about audio. Now, every time I saw him, we only talked about audio. Oh man, should I get this, should I do this, da, da, da. He was totally involved. Invo involved with his audio to hear more from his music. And he was constantly buying albums. He had never bought an album before in his life. Now every day it seemed like when he was on his lunch break he was finding another record store. It was an amazing thing to witness about a man who went from zero interest to 100% in because he heard it and he got it. And it's pretty special. I still think about him. Anyway, matter of fact, I heard from him maybe a year ago, and it was still, still all the way up. Back to my listening session last night. So one of the first records I played was Jimi Hendrix, Band of Gypsies, live at the Fillmore East, December 31st, New Year's Eve, 1969. I've always loved this record. Anyway, this particular uh, LP that I was holding in my hands was a test pressing. It wasn't a production record. And the thing was, I was actually present at the cutting session, at the mastering session for this very LP here in New York City at Sterling Sound in 1997, 1996 or 1997. And also present at this session was Jimi Hendrix's uh, sister, Janie Hendrix, and also Jimi Hendrix's recording engineer, he was there to supervise, Eddie Kramer. <laughs> this is a pretty... Pretty special, a special afternoon I was witness to. Anyway, so we were there for the actual mastering session of this record that I was playing last night. So, oh, so when I arrived at the session, <laughs> the tape wasn't actually there yet. It was supposed to be there, but for some reason there was a mix-up. The tape hadn't been delivered. So I was chatting with Eddie Kramer, and I was chatting with Janie Hendrix. It was fantastic. Again, the studio itself, oh, and the mastering engineer, was George Marino, legendary. He has since passed, but he was a legendary engineer. He had mastered all the Led Zeppelin records. Great guy, fun to be around. Anyway, I was having the time of my life. Meanwhile, no master tape. Oh, so this brings up the question, when they say uh, mastered from the original uh, tape, this time I can say absolutely <laughs> it was because the tape finally arrived in a box. Delivery guy drops off the tape, and there's Eddie Kramer, and he's pointing to the writing on the box, his writing on the box itself, so it wasn't a copy of a copy, you know, that sort of thing. Anyway, so uh, we start to listen to the tape, and the mastering engineer, George Marino, he's taking notes. He's not mastering it yet. He's listening. He's, you know, doing his job. And then, at last, it's time to actually cut 
there's a record cutting lathe in the studio. It's time to cut the master, the LP master of Jimi Hendrix Band of Gypsies. This is for classic records, this record company. Anyway, so they start to cut it. And I'm listening to the music coming out of the speakers directly from the master tape itself. And I'm watching the lathe. And I'm getting goosebumps. Literally, I'm getting goosebumps telling you this right now. And I was getting goosebumps listening last night. And I'm saying, this is amazing. I'm with the recording engineer for the record, who's supervising. Um, I'm with Jimi Hendrix's sister, or half-sister, Janie. <laughs> I'm the other thing. Anyway, it was incredible, in case you didn't pick up on my excitement. It was amazing. Anyway, so last night I'm playing the record, the test pressing of that session. And there it was. There it was. There was Jimi Hendrix. There was Buddy Miles on drums. And there was the Phil Maurice and Billy Cox on bass. There was the Phil Maurice. Oh, and one of the things that Eddie Kramer told me that day was that to record that record, it wasn't like a separate control room in the film where he's, he actually was under the stage of the film where that's where he was working that night. I said, how could you do that? There's all that sound bleeding in from the stage itself to you down there. He said he had done it, he had recorded many sessions at film where so he had his method. And the result is in listening that this is a great recording. Just the recording quality itself is really good. It doesn't sound like any other Jimi Hendrix record, and it shouldn't because that's the only one that was recorded at the film where we, So it has the sound of the building, the sound of the concert hall, the 2,000 or so people in the audience. It's breathtaking. So in case you ever wonder why Steve is so into vinyl and why he gets so worked up when he talks about it, that's one of the reasons. <laughs> because it has this ability to take you somewhere now, of course, a good digital recording can also take you places. If the engineers did their job, recording, mixing, mastering engineers did their job, yeah, it can sound really, really good. But there's something about the way analog connects the dots that digital never does. I don't know why. I don't understand. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Digital should be just better in every way. But it doesn't feel that way. Now, of course, everybody is, is entitled to their own opinion and has their own opinion, and that's for sure. And please, share them in the comments below. I'm just telling you what I experienced. So another record that I played, which I wasn't present at the mastering for, was this Herbie Hancock record. Now, this is an unusual record. This is from the mid-60s, but it's not a typical jazz record. It's basically just uh, Herbie on piano, of course. And I forget who's the bass player, and a bunch of percussionists, so drums and percussion. It just lays out these grooves, and my Klipsch Cornwall speakers was just letting them fly. <laughs> the room was filled with Herbie and his band, and I had a big smile plastered on my face. I was having a great time. Another record that made me smile was this uh, Cowboy Junkies, The Trinity Sessions. Now that's from the 80s. And that, I mean, they're a rock band, but this one wasn't recorded in a studio, and it wasn't a live recording. Well, it was live to two-track, basically, in a church. So all the musicians are playing live, including Margot, the vocalist. So it has sort of an audiophile feel, because you're hearing everyone basically <laughs> mixed down to two tracks live as it's happening. I'm pretty sure it's two tracks. Maybe you guys can correct me. It's a phenomenal recording because it has a band in a space. This is hugely important to me. Why, you say? Because that's what it would sound like if you were actually there. You know, with Jimi Hendrix and with the Cowboy Junkies, it, the, the space that the music was being performed in was, was part of the sound of the music. Recording studios don't, or not supposed to at least, have a sound. They're just a dead space and then they add reverb to the session after the fact. So it doesn't sound like the band. It sounds like the band with stuff, you know, put on top of it after the fact. When you hear a recording that sounds like people playing together in a room, Trinity Sessions in a church, Jimi Hendrix at Fillmore East, it just communicates the music in a, let's say, 
<laughs> more natural way? Could, could I use that word? I think so, something like that. Then I played this uh, REM record document. I bought it used at Princeton Record Exchange, great record store in Princeton, New Jersey, naturally enough. I paid 99 cents for it. I got my money's worth. You know, I, I, don't, I don't claim to be a big REM fan. I'm not. But when I do listen to REM on vinyl, I get, I get closer to being a fan. Because the band sounds like a band more so on vinyl than they do in streaming or CDs or whatever. They sound more like, yeah, they're there to play. Especially the rhythm section, they cook. It has some kind of kinetic pulse to it that, that really is exciting. You know, it is exciting music. It has a sense of its time. Really very, very well communicated through vinyl. As for my playback system, I will put it in the description box below the video, in case you're wondering. Steve, what are you playing all this stuff on? Well, it's all there. All there for you. Oh, you know, another thing. Oh, so I have this friend who's really into mono vinyl, monophonic, single channel, pre-stereo records, especially jazz, Blue Note, Riverside, that kind of stuff from the... 50s and 60s. He loves it. Matter of fact, he loves it so much. He has a mono cartridge. Matter of fact, he loves mono so much. He has two turntables, one dedicated to mono, another turntable dedicated to stereo. And he was waxing on about mono about a week ago when I was talking to him. And he just made it sound like you're just so much closer to the music when you hear it in mono. He said, yeah, when I play stereo, it's bigger, he said, but it's more uh, disembodied. It's like a ghost image of people playing. He said, when I play mono, it's like right there, right there. There you are, right there. Okay, okay. Now, I, I don't really get the mono thing. I've tried, but it does help if you have a mono cartridge. And by the way, I'm pretty sure Grado makes affordable mono cartridges because mono cartridges work differently than stereo cartridges, up and down, side to side. It's a whole different thing than playing stereo. LPs, and if you have a turntable with a detachable head shell, well then you could have one mono cartridge and a stereo cartridge and then just switch between when you're playing mono records, you play the mono cartridge. When you're playing stereo records, you play the stereo cartridge. No biggie, right? Because if you are into older music that's in mono, the mono thing really speaks to a lot of people. But that's it. We each look for what's important to us, right? That's this, there's no universal fit in any of this, right? It's like we are each going our own way. We have to find our own bliss. That's the point of it. And speaking of bliss, let's check out the Audiophiliac viewer system of the day. Okay, so this one comes from Jan. He's in Bergen, Norway. He likes to listen to anything that's musically appealing, and he thinks there's probably a new DAC and phono preamp in his future. As for the system, He's running Gamut D200 Mark III 200 watt mono power amps, a Gamut D3 preamp, Tanberg 3002A preamp, Lynn Carrick Mark III CD player with power supply and laser upgrade. The turntable is vintage. It's a Kenwood KD500 with an SME 3009 Series 3 tone arm cartridge. Sure V15 Type 3 with a Shibata stylus. Now the speakers, I, I've heard about these speakers, but I've never actually heard them. They're Larson 8.2s. Thanks, Jan. If I do say so myself, that was pretty nice. If you want to have your picture, if you want to have your system be the Audiophiliac Viewer System of the Day, all you have to do, super easy to do, take some pictures, that's the first step, JPEGs only, and send them to me at audiophiliac at mail.com. Not Gmail, just mail. Audiophiliac at mail.com. Just send two, please, please, just send two JPEGs. If you send 10, I'm only going to look at two. Just send two JPEGs. Uh, list the, the components that are in the system. That helps a lot. Make it a really nice picture, a cool, interesting, well-lit, well-composed picture. That really counts. 
Um, but the but the system itself doesn't have to be expensive, doesn't have to be exotic. It just has to be, well, interesting, to me at least, <laughs> and hopefully other people. Have you checked out the Patreon? It's very it's where the hip people hang out, and you can find it at p a t r e o n dot com slash audiophiliac, and most definitely there is a link below this video. And now I can say my work here is 100% complete. Thank you as always for watching, and I really, really do hope to see you back here again very, very soon. Bye-bye.